So I guess the question is, what is the economic impact of BVD in Australian beef herds? I guess the overseas data varies relatively widely depending on who's researching it. I guess the dairy sector, they recognize a larger impact due to the production of milk and the impact of BVD on milk quality and production. But the estimates vary anywhere from 20 up to as much as $100 per cow per year in herds that still harbor the virus. I guess the, the key point of that is that consistently, no matter who's investigating the cost of BVD, consistently they're demonstrating that it's a fairly costly disease. Initially, the awareness was around the production of PIs, and obviously that comes at a cost. But uh, re the reproductive consequences were the second thing that people focused on. And then lately, the immune suppressive ability of this virus, the more we investigate it, the more we find that no matter what you put in tandem with BVD, for instance, if you have an outbreak of scours and calves, having BVD in the mix will greatly exacerbate that, and all these things come at a cost. So I guess I feel confident that in the beef herd, it's you know around 25, 30 bucks a head. Um, on average, in herds that have it, and in dairies, maybe around 60, 70. Some work out of New Zealand supports that as well, which is similar strains as Australia. And um, really, what people perceive is when we have big wrecks, so groups of animals without immunity come in contact with a PI, they can get some pretty nasty wrecks that some producers have reckoned that has cost them into the millions. And so it's, it's not a disease that consistently chews the same amount out of each property each year. It's quite variable depending upon when animals come in contact with a PI. So sometimes when the wrecks happen, it's very expensive. Other times it grumbles along and it's almost imperceptible. In the beef production game, I guess it's one, production of PIs, two, um, in interference with the animals either getting pregnant or maintaining pregnancy. And so production of PIs is kind of part of that because PIs aren't, a, aren't really a saleable um, product in the end. And then lastly, immune suppression. So again, BVD combining, having a synergistic effect, almost a catalyst-like effect with other diseases, ends up costing producers financially. The first step to working out whether or not you got BVD on your property is to look for evidence of exposure. PI animals are the primary means of transmitting the virus. So if you have animals on your farm that have been blood tested to look for antibodies, antibodies are created by the animal in response to being exposed to the virus. So if you have animals that are antibody positive, especially a high proportion, that suggests that those animals have come in contact with the PI. And if they haven't come in contact with the PI, in most instances, that means that PI was your own PI, home raised. It's not that often that it's blowing over the fences as much as people initially perceived because they didn't realize they had it. And when they did discover they had it, oh, geez, where'd it come from? It's often been grumbling along on a herd. And when people do perceive it, working with their veterinarian is when there's been a wreck and the veterinarian's been called out and looked and said, geez, we've had a bit of a, a BVD outbreak here, which is usually associated with animals that are pregnant without immunity coming in contact with a PI for a reasonable amount of time. So the first step is really contacting your veterinarian and then usually serology, so blood testing, to look for immunity. And then after that, we can structure programs to vaccinate or ear notch where appropriate and try to utilize all those tools to put together a systematic strategy that's cost effective and profitable for the producer. Well, so blood testing and then antigen tests. So I guess in beef herds, you've got blood samples. You've got um, for either antibody or antigen. Um, for antigen, there's a lot of tissue samples. So ear notch testing, uh, some people use hair testing. Um, there are, there's um, labs like myself that I run. There's uh, government labs that run antigen tests or antibody tests. Uh, we run antibody testing as well. And then there's uh, point of care tests that can be run on farm, working in conjunction with your veterinarian to, to source those tools. The dairy game's got some other cool tools, um, primarily being milk testing. So we can test that individual milk sample. So we can test individual animals through either the milk, both for antibody or for antigen. And we can actually check the VAT. So we can test the VAT sample and see what the average immune level of, immunity level of the entire milking herd is, which we can then monitor on a routine basis to see if that's changing dramatically. If it does, let's investigate it. And we can also test that VAT to see if there's a persistent, persistently infected animal contributing to that VAT. So if there's a PI in the milking herd, that VAT will be positive, and we can say, aha, we have a milking or lactating PI, let's go about trying to find her. So the, the dairy game's got some pretty neat tools. Plus, they have a huge advantage in that they remove the calves from their mothers, so they got plenty of time to, to investigate those females to make sure they enter that dairy both PI-free and immune.
I guess in, in our particular laboratory, um, the ear notch test globally has come to the fore as the gold standard for testing animals. It used to be PCR and VI, but the, the issues associated with PCR um, and the, the levels of um, uh, cleanliness for, for lab laboratories has in, created some specificity issues. Um, I guess the ear notch test is the most widely used test globally for the diagnosis of PI animals. Um, it's incredibly sensitive. The work that's been done indicates that it could be as good as 100% sensitive when used appropriately, so when, when run properly. Specificity, so again, the accuracy of is it a PI is, is quite, um, is very extremely uh, specific as well. And if you compare that to a blood sample, blood sample, um, maternal antibody interferes in animals under six months of age. So many times I need to test calves before the bulls go back out again, and a blood test is inappropriate for that sort of test. Hair test is essentially a very small ear notch. I guess there's not a whole uh, huge amount of difference between them. Um, I guess the issue is there it's a very small ear notch, and I, so I don't think there's any published research as to yet as to whether or not the ear notch is, or the hair test is as sensitive as the uh, ear notch test, but essentially it's a very small ear notch. Me personally, I like to, in most instances, leave a mark if I can in the animal to know that it's been tested. But yeah, the, we've got very good tools, regardless of how you slice it, to manage BVD, with both in the vaccines available, the vaccine, single vaccine available in Australia, and the diagnostic aids that we've got, both antibody tests and antigen tests. Transient infected animal is an animal that's got a functional immune system, so any adult animal that's never been exposed to the virus meets a PI or gets exposed to the virus, the virus replicates and they get over it. So they're, they develop an immune response to it and they're done with it. They're usually viremic, meaning vi circulating virus for up to a couple of weeks. Persistently infected animals were exposed in utero, specifically when they were one to four months of gestation. They mistakenly perceive as an unborn calf that BVD is normal and those calves go on to harbor the virus for their entire life and shed enormous volumes of virus for their entire life. And they're essentially the vector. PIs represent the vast majority of the infections associated with BVD, so they're very, very efficient at spreading the virus. They cause animals to have a transient infection, and if those animals that they gave a transient infection to are pregnant, that's how another PI is produced, and that's what keeps the ball rolling. From entering a herd, in most instances in Australia, it's already there, so it's a matter of trying to clean it up, and the goal is to get to get on a system where they're ensuring that each new group of replacement heifers is both immune and PI free when they go either to the bull or to their AI program before they get mated. And we can go about and try to seek out the PIs that may exist in the older management groups and get that herd to BVD free status. Now once you're clean, I guess getting it reintroduced to your herd, you just need some simple biosecurity steps. So um, you want to try to minimize the contact with unknown animals. PIs in general are pretty low incidence, one, one and a half percent, but they're very good at transmitting the virus. So any animal that comes on the place, you want to try to ensure it's not a PI. Any animal that comes back from somewhere, you probably want to let it sit for at least a couple weeks to get over what any disease, really. Most diseases, especially viruses, they'll, animals will mount an immune response and clear that infection. So it's a good idea to quarantine animals for two weeks to a month. And um, if you're trying to run a BVD-free operation, you want to ensure the animals you bring on the place are you're not bringing another PI back into the system. Well, I guess initially you want to work out um, your status, so whether it exists in your herd. Then after that, you want to um, uh, work out which management groups need protection, meaning they don't have immunity, so let's vaccinate those girls. You want to ensure that you don't bring new animals into the herd, and then you want to maintain a, a reasonable biosecurity and, and continue to monitor the herd. So ongoing heifer serology, I guess, is, is in my belief, is the best way to manage the disease. Let's screen those heifers annually, not only to make sure we're not going to introduce a PI back into the herd as a, as a breeding female, but also to measure the success of the interventions that we've been doing, to keep our ear to the ground, to make sure we haven't actually accidentally reintroduced it. If we do reintroduce it, it's not going to rip through the herd. It's actually quite a dead end in most instances because all the adult animals, none of them are PIs. It's a management group that produced a PI. As long as we don't keep that PI as a replacement female, quite often we can get back to a BVD freedom relatively quickly. Absolutely. I don't think there's a management system in existence that we can't eradicate. Every, every country that's taken a, made a concerted effort to eradicate it from every, every property in that particular uh, country has so far eventually been able to succeed. 
I guess each little farm and it's what each country in a way is like a very large farm with a whole bunch of multiple manager groups and conflicting interests. An, an individual farm would be a lot simpler than eradicating it from a country. Country or producers that that calve year round will be quite a logistical hurdle and, and also properties that, um, that where we can't get a complete muster. So it'd be much harder in the north, but I think if we, if we are required down the track to eradicate BVD, I think we can do it. Absolutely, and in southern beef enterprises and dairies, easy.